Hi everyone. Just give me one second here. I'm going to go ahead and post the stream out. Then we'll go ahead and get started. And as always, I will have the questions on the side here. So if you have any, even if they don't particularly relate to the exercise at hand, if there's any digital art painting questions or um, something you might be struggling with, feel free to ask, and I will make sure to get back to you. And as always, we do these every Wednesday at 2 p.m., and that's central time in the States, and then outside of it, it is minus 6 GMT. And usually the topic is posted about an hour, maybe an hour and a half before the actual stream on our Facebook, Twitter, and DeviantArt page. And today I will be continuing off where I left off last week, which is the paint over, which is the exercise that Concept Cookie currently has. And the whole goal of it is to work on top of a base that has a lot of flat colors, and then your main focus is to be on the shading of the actual uh, forms and the values. OK, so there we go. Now let's go ahead and start the stream off. So thanks, everyone, for coming to this live stream. Like I said before, we do these every Wednesday. And today, I will be working on Nicodemus, which is the rat from The Secret of Nim. Last week, I did Miss, Mrs. Brisby, and unfortunately, this is a good example of why you need to make sure you're saving. I lost all the work that I did last week during the live stream. And although, I mean, it only took about an hour to do, but it's still, you know, some time to work that you have to make up for. So just make sure whenever you're saving, you know exactly where you're saving it out to, and you won't have lost work. So pretty much this stream I'm going to do a little different than last week, where last week I focused on really creating a solid base and then working with your large brushes to your small brushes. Today I'm going to work kind of in a way that would be more similar to painting. So I'm going to be using mostly a circle hard edge brush, but a smaller one, and then um, work up the forms that way. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this bottom half a lot bigger so you guys can see it on the stream better. Take out that bottom bar. And the first question is, do you think anyone can draw? And I certainly do. Now, I definitely think it's easier if you grow up drawing your whole life because then at an early age, you kind of become accustomed to seeing things differently. Like, you start to see uh, size relations to each other. You see color differently. And once you're kind of in the whole art mentality, it kind of sticks with you for the rest of your life. So someone that starts at 18 is definitely at a disadvantage from someone that starts when they're, like, 6 or 7, you know? And that doesn't mean digital painting. I just mean the way that they see the world and how they start drawing. Because even at a young age, if you're drawing, like, forms or people... You'll eventually get better, but at 18, you'll definitely have a head start. But at 7, you'll start to see, like, oh, the eye forms like this. And then you'll start to see things that kind of gather up, and they stockpile all this knowledge that you continually learn, where someone that's 18 and starting doesn't have that. So I think anyone can draw, but you really have to work for it if you haven't been drawing your whole life. And the one thing I'm always asked is, how can I get better? And my biggest advice is to draw every single day. Okay, so let's go ahead. I'm going to make a new layer on top of this base layer. So pretty much you can see I'm using the circle hard edge brush. But last week I was working with, you know, doing more of a large brush capturing. But this one, I'm going to have some fun with it, make my brush size a little smaller, and kind of treat this like a painting. I'm still going to be going ahead and... Let's go ahead and put the base colors on the side here and clean up the, the base colors a little bit because if I zoom in, you can see how pixelated it is. And even in, like, in this beard, even though it's supposed to be this neutral kind of brown-gray color, you can still see how the pixels still add like purples and hues and yellows. And those pixels aren't exactly what I would want. I would rather work on a very flat colored base. And even to start this, I'm going to go ahead and go to my image size. And I know you guys can't see the menu box, or at least I'm pretty sure. No, you can't. 
Uh, I'm going to change, because right now it looks like the size of this is only 4 inches wide. I'm going to change this to 9, so that we have more pixels to work with. And that way, I can really add in more detail in the long run. OK, so back to adding our base here. And just like Mrs. Brisby, I'm not working on making it look perfect from the start. So if I go outside of the edges, or if it's not perfectly covering, I'm going to be OK with that, because a lot of the cleanup work that I like to do ends up being near the end of the actual piece itself. And the reason I really like this screen capture is because it really has a lot of different shapes that will be kind of fun to shade on top of. And instinctively, I go right toward the beard because I can already see uh, the different shading methods that I, I can use to really pop out the beard. And I'm going to blend it into the face a little bit here. Then for his face, it's like this brown color. Then we also have the challenge of these glowing eyes. So for now, I'm going to go ahead and kind of bleed this brown color right up against the edge of that glowing eye. And I'll save the glowing eye for near the end of me working on this. Because I don't want to be focusing on an area that is a very obvious attention grabber. And it's hard to look at this image without your eye immediately be drawn, be drawn to that eye. So rather than focus on it right away, I'm going to go ahead and save it for last. Then his eyebrows are sort of this light, desaturated mustard color. And once I do this base coat on top of the image, I'll show you guys the before and after of why this makes such a difference. And also, when you're screen capping, try to find, um, if you're watching it on like Netflix or wherever you're grabbing the screen cap from, Try to find as clean as a cap as you can, because if it's too blurry, it almost becomes unusable, so you can't really work with it. Where You, you do want some of the edges and the, the shapes to be kind of defined for you beforehand. Because this is supposed to be a practice on shading, not on the actual shaping. And kind of, um, oh, sorry and the actual like creative side of it in terms of the shapes and the, what they're wearing, et cetera, the colors. So almost think of this exercise as you're enhancing a foundation that's already been given to you. Ooh, questions are coming in. OK. So someone's asking, how can I improve my drawing skills? So just like what I said earlier, draw every single day. And I know that that might be kind of like, in your mind a lazy answer, but really it helps so much. And I think you'll be surprised by how much you'll be able to teach yourself. And when I was in school, I didn't have internet at my apartment. So literally when I would get home from college, I, I didn't have anything to go to but draw. So that's what I would do. And I would do it for six to eight hours almost every day. And I, I really believe that that mixed with the level of competition that was at my school really helped me grow. So I think it's healthy for you to learn a lot on your own, but also to find people that are also interested in art the same way that you are. Because even today, like I still have a really good group of solid art friends that I talk to a lot, and we're constantly asking for like critiques or pushing each other to get uh, better than our current skill level is. And I think that that constant source of encouragement, that really helps as well. But you really have to rely on yourself more than anyone else. So yes, practice every day. It doesn't matter if it, it's even digital. You can still do it traditional, it's just as long as you're drawing and you're actively drawing. And when I say that, I don't mean that you should be drawing the same thing over and over that you know you're comfortable with. Draw something maybe that you're not used to drawing, like maybe draw a foot study today instead of um, maybe what you're used to drawing on a typical day. Uh, someone's asking, I'm 16 years old, all my life is, in all of my life I've been drawing. I'm trying to improve my drawings and I draw every day, but I know that I don't have a talent. My cousin doesn't try at all and he is better than me because he got talent. 
This is definitely a tricky subject because I always thought of drawing as uh, a, in kind of like an acquired skill. Like even when I thought, or when we were taught in school that in the medieval times, uh, drawing and art was a trade and you would learn it like a craft, just like you would leatherworking or metalworking. And just through, you know, practice and perseverance, you'll get the hang of it eventually. You have to because you're doing it every day. I do believe, though, that some people have a natural knack for it because they have an eye for it. And when I say that, I mean the way that they view their drawing and how to execute their drawings is differently for every person. So in your case, I think your cousin might go about it a bit stronger than you might where you might not know how to go about it, where he does know how. So once you learn how he goes about it, or his mindset, or uh, like what is he doing that I'm not doing, that's when you start to improve as an individual artist as well. So don't get discouraged if you feel like you can't do it because drawing is this skill that you're handed down through when you're born, and uh, you'll never be as good as some of these other artists out there. Because I definitely believe through perseverance and practice, you can be just as good as anyone else. Someone's asking, I started working on this last weekend, but I seem to be having a really hard time finding the right colors to use for it. What advice would you have that can potentially help with finding colors that don't totally wash out the image? So even for Nicodemus, and I guess, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and answer your question when I get to more of the shading part because this is definitely a study on shading, but coincidentally, it's also a study on picking colors and how you go about doing that. Because it would be easy to say, okay, well, in the light source, I would just go closer to white, and then in the shadows, I would go closer to black. But it's not exactly the way that is recommended, nor will you get a good result. So right after I do this base coat of color, then I'll go ahead and kind of explain how I would go about choosing the colors. So then if I turn the slur on and off, you can see how a lot of that pixely look to it is kind of disappeared. And that's because the screen cap was at a lower resolution. So I needed to just kind of fix it almost. And it looks like the fur on his body is this almost darker purple color. So he's definitely a lot more intricate than Mrs. Brisby one we did last week where with her you can almost just see like the head is a circular shape and you can shade it according to that but with him you have a whole bunch of different shapes going on and you can play with a, a whole new slew of like cylinders and he still has a lot of spherical shapes but they're either pulled or extended and that's why I said uh, cylindrical like his fingers definitely have that form of shaping to them. And they're extremely bony and like uh, shapely for sure. So then he even, to accentuate the long bony fingers, he has even super long nails that we can shade ahead as well. I'm just giving a kind of soft underside shadow to the hand. Nothing detailed or anything yet. And he has these warts, which I'm going to actually pull the same color from the beard. Try this like this gray color. I'm 
And for the most part, I'm just going to leave his cloak very much black. And I'll pop out the colors around it. So the black will be kind of a nice contrast to all the shading that will be going on with the colors. And I know sometimes something like laying out the base colors might not seem that fun. But like I said last week, sometimes you have to do the grunt work to do the fun work. So as long as you can just, you know, bite your tongue and get through the not so fun part of digital art, you'll have a lot of fun during the the beauty part of the concepting. Okay, so I would say I'm at a point where I can go ahead and start doing some shading. So you can see it's still a rough pass over, but the difference between before and after is very great in the sense that now I have literally like flat base colors I can work on top of, which is exactly what I wanted. Now before I do that, let me go ahead and see what other questions are here. Someone's asking, how would you change the overall size of your canvas? Taking the image from smaller to bigger without opening a new and bigger canvas than putting your current piece there. So what you can do, and I know you can't see it on my screen, but I'll walk you through it, is you just go to the top menu bar where it says image, click it, and then one of the options are image size. And literally that's exactly where you can go to change the width and the height. And then as soon as you change it, your image will adjust accordingly. Oh, someone's asking, what did I think of GIMP? I think it is on its way to becoming a solid software, but I think still as of now, there's still some kinks to it where it's not quite up to the standard as Photoshop, but I feel like in time it will, since it is an open source software, it just has to give the time to really kind of nurture it. Someone's asking, what is the hardest thing you face in drawing? The hardest thing I face in drawing hmm, is feeling like I have to set up steps for myself to follow for every single piece. I'm very methodical when I draw, and I feel like I get very comfortable when I have kind of a set step list that I have in my head to follow. And when I don't have that, I feel like it's frustrating or if I find a new path or new art style that I kind of enjoy, and I try to integrate that into my steps. So I think the hardest part is letting go and being more free with my drawing, not worrying about if you know the colors are going outside of the lines and knowing that I can fix it later, not wanting to detail it right away. Just things, it's all kind of a mind game. I definitely see the concept art as being a very big mental pro process as well as a drawing process. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with the coloring. So this was someone's question on um, finding the right colors to use it. So, okay, so for this beard, right away, this is my base color. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start adding some light to it to start really giving it some form. So I'm going to go to my color picker. And I know you guys can't see this on the live screen, but I'm going lighter in value. And I'm also bending my hue towards yellow. So if I lay it out here. So what I don't want you guys doing is choosing just pure gray to white because this is a boring transition where it's only adjusting in the value. Now the one that I'm going to be doing will be bending in value, saturation, and in hue. These are my four colors that I'm going to be using. So you can see the difference between a kind of desaturated one versus one that pulls on saturation, hue, and value. Now, that's not to say you always have to do that, but in cases where the lighting is very fantastical, why not have fun with the way you lay out your colors? So for the beard, I'm thinking about, OK, there's a light source, sort of, in the scene. So I'm going to play on the fact that the beard has this kind of wave look to it. So then in areas where the wave would bend or where that the arc is, so right here and right here, this is where the highlights would be on the beard. 
So then I'm going to focus on laying out the base code and pushing down strongest on my tablet where it's running over that middle point. And you'll start to really see it kind of pop off the more that we add here. And then also for this beard area down here, because he has a super long beard. So down here, where the curve, it's almost like an S, and then on both points of the S, where the arc is, that's where you want to shade your highlights the strongest. And since this is hair, and I'm trying to replicate that, I'm not trying to go detailed yet, but I am trying to do my brush strokes in the shape and the motion that the hair is going in. So the direction is very important because your brush strokes will be seen, and you want your brush strokes to follow the flow of the hair rather than work against it. I, every now and then I like to make sure that I'm following the original. So that's why I really want you guys to have both images on the same canvas. So you can either do a quick look or even just hide the layers that you've added like that. So then I can see like this cut right below his chin. I want to make sure I keep that intact. So I definitely want to stay true to the additions I'm adding on. Oops, that was from my earlier test. And I also find drawing very relaxing. So working with a small brush like this sometimes isn't the most time efficient, but since I'm doing this more as a practice, and I'm really trying to focus on different areas. It's OK if I'm not going at the speed of light to try to finish this. OK, so that's our base coating layer. So now let's go ahead and add the next color, which would be this yellow right here. And I'm going to be doing the same thing, where I'm going to be working from that middle point of the curve of the beard and then bleeding it out to the edges. And another term for this is called pillow shading, where pretty much the lighting, it, it almost you could almost not follow a direct lighting, where you're focusing on really just pushing out the forms and the values of the shapes. And to do that, you're just kind of uh, shading them from the inside to the edges. And then I'm also making sure that not all the hair strands are the same width because sometimes I will add a monotony to it where it almost becomes uninteresting to look at. So try to break up your shapes a little bit and maybe make some strands of hair thicker where some would retain that thinness. And I really like how this darker gray kind of meets up right against this lighter color. So I'm going to keep that in there.
Hi, right, someone's asking, I asked this on the last live stream, but you did not reply because of the time zone issues. How do you start a digital painting, a character? The reason I ask this question is because I almost get scared of putting down a brush stroke. This is a good question because um, a lot of people have a hard time starting. And just little tricks that you can do to kind of help yourself out from the get-go is uh, don't work on a solid white background. Try working on like a neutral gray. I know that sounds really simple and like it wouldn't actually help, but really, your eyes, it's so much less intimidating to be staring at a neutral gray than it is a blank white canvas because then it feels like every brush stroke you make is so permanent compared to a gray background where you know, for some reason the contrast isn't as heavy, so your eye almost tricks you into thinking it's not as significant as it would have been if it was on a white paper. But when I start, I try to start very fast, and very almost sloppy to the point where I'm looking to add, I'm looking for interesting shapes. I'm not even so much looking for the anatomy. I'm not looking to uh, make anything proportionally. Well, in a sense, I am looking to make it proportionally accurate, but that's not my goal. My goal is to find interesting shapes and color balances from the start. Now, it's not how a lot of artists start. I think a lot of artists will start in grayscale or they'll do silhouettes. And for a while, I did that as well. But I think you'll find some technique for you that works fairly well and this is the one that I kind of found for me over the years so I would say try a bunch of different ways to start out don't just rely on one single way let me grab this lighter color For some of this, it almost looks too smooth to me. So I'm going to go ahead and switch to my chalk brush, which is this one. And you can even download this in the Concept Cookie Basic brushes, where I like having a little texture to things, where if it's almost too smooth, it, it bothers me sometimes. But it all depends on what piece I'm working on. So for like this one, I definitely want to add a little texture to it. A little sense of graininess I think will help accentuate it. Someone's asking, is there any new projects you are planning on working on? Uh, in terms of with Concept Cookie, we definitely have a lot of things planned. And I guess kind of as a subtle announcement, in the summer we're going to have this big planned out thing where every single week we're going to have a new AAA author have a tutorial live on the site. We've already got about eight confirmed, so we need just four more. And uh, the summer will definitely be a big time for tutorials. But in terms of, I guess, what I have planned for Concept Cookie, and in terms of personal work as well, I'm doing a lot of convention work right now. Even right now I'm a bit uh, kind of stressed out. It's because I've been running around so much the past few days trying to get everything together. But I would say, obviously, I'm, there's always a personal project for every artist, I feel. And mine is, has been on the back burner for a few months, unfortunately. But I think after the convention stuff and things kind of get going, I'm going to be working on it again. And mine is my uh, illustrated novel that I've wanted to do since I was a kid. And that is definitely like one of my biggest dreams in life is to complete that. And then for Concept Cookie, I would love to have a start to finish um, kind of character tutorial where it takes you from the very, very basics to the very end of um, like completing a character and how to get better on your own, where you don't even need to be watching tutorials anymore, where you can kind of teach yourself. Not to say that, you know, every now and then you can't watch a tutorial, because I can definitely pull up YouTube, look at like a Fang Zoo video, and learn something completely new that will help me. But I definitely think you need to get to a point where you can trust yourself in uh, how you would go about doing something. And once you have all those tools that you acquire over the years, that's when you'll be able to kind of work things out on your own. And I guess I should have explained a little more. So right now, my mind's kind of on autopilot, where I'm just going. So I'm looking for different forms and shapes that I can start to shade out. And... I guess I should have mentioned that before I kind of just went for it. So
So then even for him, what I'm doing for his face is I'm grabbing the brown with my eyedropper tool, picking it up, going to my color picker, going lighter in value, staying about the same saturation, and then bending it just a tad toward yellow. So his nose is a really good example that we can work on. So I'm thinking about his nose as like a cylinder, like this. So the light's coming from this general direction, the way that we're pillow shading it. My light source is going to be strongest right here, and then it's going to pillow out to the edges. So in the same way, I want to go ahead and do that on him. I'm going to switch back to my circle hard edge brush here. For the wrinkles on his face, there's definitely like a arching movement. So this right here is over here in my example. So if the light source is coming from overhead, I'm going to have the light be the strongest on this edge over here, and then it's going to shade around to the shadow on this edge. And then right away, the light source is going to bump right up against it as it goes into shadow again. But you don't want to just shade it from the middle and then have the shadows be out. You really want this wrinkle to be defined. And to do that, it's really easy to do that with um, a, a contrast in your light sources. So I want to zoom in on the face to kind of illustrate my point here. So on this eye lap flap right here, on the bottom part of it, I'm going to have this dark shadow area right there. And the light part's going to butt up right against it. And that's going to eventually go into the shadow as well, because there's another little wrinkle right there. And then his eye definitely has that crazy glow to it, which that we'll touch on a little later. But same thing with his eyelid. We have that shadow, and then it's going to bump, butt up right against the lighter color of his head, because his head's more of a spherical shape. And then this eyelid juts, juts out from that spherical shape, so i got to shade him accordingly. And actually, just to give some more heavy emphasis on this upper eyelid, I'm going to add a darker line there. Oops. I'm going to make sure I'm staying consistent here. And I definitely don't recommend getting this close this early in a painting, but I really wanted to show you what I mean by what the shadow butting up against. So like on the bottom of the wrinkle here, I'm going to push that light source right up against that wrinkle. So you can see how that really brings it out. And then this is where you can kind of have fun and really clean it up and make it look super nice. And that's what will really add form to your, your values. So you see a lot of artists that are very timid to get very um, high contrasty with their, their values. But that's what will really pop things out, so don't be afraid to do that. So as I zoom out, See what that looks like before and after. Now for me, I, I really dislike how white it's getting. So to fix that, I'm really going to make a multiply layer and then just do a soft brush overlay. So definitely, if, like, if you your mind is going and like it has ideas, don't hold it back. Because that's the creative side of you being like, okay, something looks wrong, I need to fix that. And then your mind quickly you know, goes to a solution with your tool set that you have and figures out what you could do. So I definitely like that a lot better.
because now as I go ahead and add in even more lighting, it's easier to do it on a darker base than it is a lighter. That's why I always like working darks to light, and usually my darks are pretty dark to start out with. I like having some of that cast shadow from the eyebrow. And it's up to you to decide how much value you want to add to it. Because even as I add these lighter values, they're going to keep punching out the forms. But if you don't want it to get crazy uh, 3D looking, if you want to keep some of that illustrative feel, then be careful with how much value you're adding in. Because the more value and roundness you're adding in, the more of a 3D kind of realistic sense you're adding to it. So now his forehead looks terrible to me right now. So uh, my mind's thinking of a way to fix that. And the first thing that comes to mind is I'm going to be grabbing the color from the other side of the eye, laying it down so that I'm rounding it out, and fixing that area that feels very much flat to me. And having that underside area of the eyebrow. It's better to define it from each other. Okay, let's see what other questions we got here. Um, inspiration. How can I earn inspiration to draw? Uh, that's an interesting question. I think inspiration is all around you. And uh, there was even a good example about that where I went to a grocery store and they were selling plants for like on clearance. And there was one that was crazy. It looked like a cactus, but it was pink on the top. And it had like these crazy forms. And for whatever reason, that was really inspiring to me, and I ended up buying that plant and it's on my desk now. And it's one of those things where I can see different shapes from that. I can see a little environment that I could pull from. And it, it's kind of interesting and funny uh, to catch yourself finding inspiration in really weird places. I remember when I used to go to the gym a lot that for whatever reason, when I would run, that's when I would be um, the most creative in my thinking. I think sometimes you need to get away from like the TV and the internet and just think and think about like cool forms and designs without any kind of distractions. So inspiration can come from anywhere. Definitely helps like looking at uh, DeviantArt or well, what was CG Hub, um, other sites like Draw Crowd, sites that really focus on high caliber artwork and look at the way that they draw, look at the way that they create forms and shapes and uh, things like that. But that doesn't mean you can limit yourself just to art. You can definitely look at like fashion and be inspired or uh, things that are technical or even like motor sports, like anything can be an inspiration. It's your interest that will kind of drive where your inspiration will derive from.
Someone's asking, what kind of floating color palette do you use in Photoshop? Like the scratch pad in my paint. So I had to download one. I currently don't have it open. Let me see what it is called. It is called, oh, that's on my laptop. I believe it's just called Color Picker, and you have to, you can download it for a free trial for 30 days, but then after that you actually have to buy it. So unfortunately, Photoshop doesn't have like a built-in floating color picker as of now. And I, I really hope that they add it in the next uh, version of Photoshop. I feel like there's a lot of softwares that already do that, and it it works really well, and I find it really useful. So I'm actually surprised that Photoshop doesn't have one. I'm also giving the outline a bit more shape. So his eyebrows are another good example of where right here, this is another S, where this point right here, that's where the highlight would be hitting the strongest in terms of pillow shading. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And then you'll definitely see how it rounds it out significantly compared to what it was before. Then maybe for, let me see what it looks like up here. Again. So for these little kind of tufts of hair up here. I don't know if I want to get into finer detailing yet, but I guess um, to kind of show you an example, because I know the live stream's not going to be able to cover the entire drawing of this guy. So I'd probably have some floating strands coming off of the eyebrows just to give it sort of a more sense of realism to a sense. Because it's kind of fun to add little details of realism on a cartoon animated character. And then it becomes more of like a 3D animated uh, feel to it. I'm trying to keep them a little more raggedy, so all these hairs that are kind of sticking out, I want them to be not so clean, because he's definitely an older rat. So I want the hair to be complementing his age and his overall appearance. He definitely has that raggedy old rat appearance. Someone's asking, when you draw on your own time, do you listen to music and what sort of music? Absolutely. I don't think I draw without music, to be honest. And kind of depending on the day, what mood I'm in, or what I'm working on, it kind of depends. So, like, I would say earlier this week I was listening to kind of indie music or orchestrated music is another really big one for me. I'm a big orchestrated fan. So I could listen to, like, piano covers um, all day. And then I also get into moods where I can just put a song on repeat. Like if I find a song I really like, I can just put that literally on repeat for an entire day. <laughs> and I know it, it probably annoys the hell out of people that I'm around, but uh, I can kind of get lost in the song. But a lot of the times, if I'm working on a character, I like to find songs that, for me, kind of complement the character itself. And that way, I, for some reason, I feel like that really puts my mind in a different set where I'm thinking about the character more and who they are and then kind of thinking about uh, their personality and trying to bring that out through my drawing. So I would say for this guy, Nicodemus, if I was listening to music instead of live streaming, I'd probably put on 
and orchestrated type soundtrack. All right, so someone's asking, can you please show us how you choose colors to represent light? All right, so let's say, uh, all right, his nose. His nose is a good example because I haven't even touched upon it yet. So the base color is this purple. So what I don't want to see is a transition from purple to white. And then you choose the colors in between to kind of represent the transition between the two. This is a very prime, primary way of thinking about working with color and light. So we're going to completely get rid of that. So the way I like to do my colors is when I open my color picker, and I know you can't see it, but I'll lay down each of the colors. I like to go lighter in value, and then I bend it toward whatever color is warmer. So in this case, since this color is sort of a soft purple, I'll bend it toward that red color. And then I'll do it again, higher in value, and saturation, and then bending my color more toward a warm color. And then one more time to really emphasize the gradient we got going on here. So this is a lot more interesting than a purple to white, because then you're also getting a, a hue contrast. And then when going darker for my shadows, I'll go a little darker in my value, about the same saturation, and then I'll bend it toward blue. And then I'll do it again. But since this was a darker color to begin with, it's a little harder to see. If I outline this in white really quick. So that's the transition that we got going on. You can see how this is actually a much more interesting color gradient that we got going on that we can pull from rather than just going from purple to white. So why don't I go ahead and use these colors for the nose here. So that I'm going to be thinking about shading it like a, a circle, or a sphere, where the bottom side of that sphere wouldn't be catching of the, any of that light for the most part. And then this is very color. It's almost like a highlight. There we go. Then if I really wanted to make that highlight more concentrated, then I would pull the colors around it and kind of edge it off like that. And there we go. So that is just a quick way that I would go about choosing colors. Someone's asking, can you tell us about your learning process? Do you look for resources? Ask your friends. I guess. Uh, for me, it was a really slow and steady one where I I was almost stubborn, where I don't I didn't want people helping me. Or I didn't want to have to ask because I felt like I wanted to do it on my own and I wanted to learn it on my own. And I think that actually made it worse where then it took me longer to learn something where if someone knows what they're doing, if there is someone or a friend or even a mentor or an artist that you want you enjoy their work and you just want some advice from. Really listen to what they have to say, and you don't know everything. And I think that was one of those hard pills to swallow where you have to realize there are artists better than me, and there always is going to be an artist that is better than me. So I can always learn something new to help me in my own work. And I think once you kind of accept that you can always learn more, that's when you'll start to grow more. So definitely do more studies on uh, things that you're not comfortable with and you'll you'll surprise yourself with how much you learn through that and don't be afraid to talk to people or ask for a critique or um, showcase your art
Someone's asking, what are your brush presets? It looks so smooth, it blends so nicely with the canvas. So um, I know you can't see my brush preset menu, but this is just the Circle Hard Edge brush with a little spacing on it, 100% hardness, 100% opacity, and it's purely through the transfer of the brush. So it doesn't even have shape dynamics turned on. It's purely through the pen pressure setting my opacity. And this is one of those where it's a personal preference, so it, it may work for you, it may not. You might like having shape dynamics turned on, you might like having opacity turned on, but this is definitely one of the brushes I feel really comfortable using. So maybe it'll work for you as well. Uh, let me zoom out here. What do we got? I'm going to flip it. So I definitely see some areas I need to work on. And I think I should have done more of a warm-up practice just to really get a good feel of Nicodemus and the way I wanted to shade it. So in areas like the eyebrow that kind of curves under, we will just go ahead and make that a bit darker. Get that cool little kind of visual trick as if uh, that underside of the hair isn't being lit in any way. I, I really don't like how it almost looks like the eyebrow and the beard are touching. I'm going to go ahead and try to pull that up. So this is a good practice on separating items from each other. And it's pretty much how you go about laying, laying down your light source. And I want to make it look like it's coming out of the face here. Okay, so another question is, I know you touched on this last week, but lately I've been struggling with wrist soreness pain and I was wondering if you have an, anything specific that helps. So I still luckily haven't had to deal with that. I know I even talked about this last week where Loesch, the famous YouTube or the DeviantArt artist, uh, put out something recently talking just about that specific subject matter. And I think it helps to keep your wrist flat, so don't bend it. Um, you want to keep it not so crooked. You don't want to be like putting strain on it. But it's a really unfortunate thing where I think most artists kind of, in the back of their head, know that at some point they're going to experience that kind of pain, especially if they have like long hours or something happens where it just, you know, you're just overworking your muscles in the hand. So I just say be conscious of it, take breaks if you need to. 
and just be careful with the way that you're holding the pen on the tablet. So here I'm adding more little tufts of fur to his face because his face is looking rather flat to me. So I wanted to uh, fix that. So now in areas where you don't always have to go for super realism, so here's a good example of where in his beard, oh, and it looks like Photoshop. I'm getting that weird glitch. I don't know if you can see it on the screen, but it's the glitch where all the menus become pure white, and it's a really annoying glitch. And if you just restart Photoshop, it'll be fine, but I'm just going to go ahead and work with it. But what I was going to say is... I was going to pull in some blues in this gray beard right here. Oops. And somehow that turned to a multiply layer. There we go. Okay. So I'm pulling some of those blues into the gray of the beard just to give it some cool accent color. And obviously when I lay it down right away, it's very much overbearing. Actually, I might even change it to purple. Let me go ahead and change that. Since the highlights in the beard are almost a yellow, to add a subtle complement to that, I'm going to add just a few purple hues into the beard. And doing things like this are just some things you kind of learn over time. Like, oh, yeah, that, that would look really cool if I added that because you've done it in the past or you've seen another artist do it and you want to try it for yourself. I'm really starting to like how withered the beard look or the face looks. Now I kind of want to add more of that look. So the beard right now looks very flat and a little too clean to me. So then from here, what I would probably end up doing, I'm going to go ahead and merge these layers together. Oops. So you can see as I combine these layers, the before and after effect. So there's the effect we got going on right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a copy of all these merged layers. I'm going to change it to a multiply layer. And obviously, I really, <laughs> it's obviously too dark right now, but I love the contrast we got going on with that face. So now using my eraser tool, I'll go through and erase some of the highlighted areas. But that multiply layer will really enhance your colors. But you don't want to overuse multiply and overlay. 
So I try to save it for times where I think I need it more. Then I'll kind of erase all the areas I haven't really worked on yet. Because I don't want it to be just complete black from um, the areas that we haven't worked on. So if I was more in like my quick mode phase, where it was my kind of autopilot mode, I call it, I'll kind of show you what that would look like. So I stay zoomed out, and I work very fast, and I kind of let, let my mind just take over. So this is where I'll usually get kind of lost in a song, or I'll be uh, kind of thinking about other things. So then this is where art becomes very relaxing to me, because I don't even really have to be actively thinking so much as letting my mind kind of take over. Okay, now, before I cut the stream off as well, because I see we're running out of time here, I want to talk about how I would go about doing the glow on the eye. So to do that, oh, it won't let me choose an overlay layer. So what I would probably do is I would work with overlay layers and uh, a normal layer. So I'm going to go ahead, grab that yellow. Blow it out a little bit. Then grab much more intense yellow. And it's really hard to do that with my Photoshop glitch that's going on right now. Because I can't even select colors. You can see the effect that this gives. And from here, I would choose an overlay layer and then even enhance that more. So you definitely want that strong contrast in the hue and the saturation when you're doing things that are glowing. And you could almost pull from pure whites if you wanted to in the center. Like that. Like I said, I would definitely pull from my overlay layer, and currently I can't do that because all my menus are white screened or are white, kind of whited out. I really need to just grab the the plugin to fix that. So I guess before I cut out, let me just share with you something that I would probably take this next. So up until this point, I've been pillow shading everything, but near the end, I kind of like adding little touches that don't make lighting sense so much as it is just kind of art 
sense. So like highlighting or outlining things in a lighter color. It doesn't mean you have to do everything, but I like to give some accents that don't have to be hyper-realistic. Like that. Then I would probably do just other areas as well. It's like on the fur. So I think it gives something for the, the viewer to look at and uh, just add some more interest to it as a whole. Then from far away, it'll have that cool look to it, like that. So if I hide that layer on and off, you can just see how it's a subtle little difference, but I think it adds a, a cool little flair to it and something that's a little more unique to the artist. So with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and cut off. I hope some of these tips and tricks that I showed you along the way will help you, and hopefully you'll do this exercise. I think this is a really fun one that you should definitely try out. And it's uh, very de-stressful. So you don't have to be worrying about the base or being creative or setting up your composition or your scene or your character or what the character is going to be. Because literally all that is laid out for you. The only thing you have to be thinking about is shading it and thinking about your lighting. So it's a really good practice, and this is something that will improve your skill level no matter what level you're at. And it'll give you kind of a taste of looking at purely shading something rather than having to always think about the entire process of art. So I really like this that this kind of highlights a specific section of it. And I might be a bit biased because I love shading, but uh, this is definitely one of my favorite exercises to date. So with that, I'll go ahead and cut this one out. So thank you guys for coming to this live stream. I do these every Wednesday uh, at 2 p.m., and that's central time if you're in the States, and that's minus 6 GMT if you're outside. And the subject matter is usually posted about an hour, hour and a half beforehand on our DeviantArt, our Facebook, and our Twitter. And it usually will kind of delve with whatever the current exercise is for that week. But sometimes we have fun ones where we do something just a little different or we'll uh, test out maybe some questions that or a suggestion that a user had. But for the most part, if you are going to be, this is going to call this done. And for now, obviously, i got to keep working on it to uh, make this look presentable. But uh, I want to thank you guys for coming to this live stream. If you guys are in the Chicago area this weekend, I will be going to the first Concept Cookie convention where I will be handing out prints, coupons, um, buttons, just a whole slew of things. And I just love meeting the community. So if you're in the area, feel free to stop by and say hi to my uh, booth. And I'll make sure to give you um, our free coupon. And as always, thanks again for coming to these live streams. And if you have any questions that didn't make it in the actual airtime, you can always feel free to message me and I will make sure to get back to you. So thanks again for watching, guys, and hopefully we'll see you next week.